Hello, hello. Welcome to the Cannabis Nurses Network. CNN is proud to announce our valued partnership with Canna Keys, and we're super excited to have Uva and Doug here with us today. Um, they're here to give us an in-depth look into the Canna Keys resource tool that they've been developing over many years, and we're super excited that it is now live and launched. Um, this tool is going to help us unlock the science of the endocannabinoid system and really help to better equip us as healthcare providers in supporting our patients' uh, cannabinoid supplementation. And it's with great respect and honor that we introduce Doug and Dr. Blushing today. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to the minds behind Canakees. Doug and Dr. Blushing, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you, Heather. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to the whole CNN community, Starlight and everyone else. We're really thrilled to be here. And um, I, I just wanna say a quick word of, of thanks to Heather and Starlight and, and everyone at, at CNN for working with us and engaging with us and supporting the work um, over the many months and years that we've been developing the Canna Keys 360 platform. And that's what we're gonna to demo today. We're going to talk before the demo a little bit about what the challenges are around understanding the science of cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. And then we're gonna get into the platform. I'll share my screen and we'll run through uh, the various functionality of the, of the four searches um, that allows users to access uh, the, the data bank of, of science and also filter and understand some of the functionality. Um, after the demo, we're gonna have uh, a time for some questions. Um, and I would uh, ask folks if they'd like to, to put their questions into the chat and we could handle some of them. We'll keep an eye on it, handle some of them as we go. And then we'll have some time at the end to, to deal with any others that are there. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Uva, and he's gonna talk a little bit about the challenges of, of making use and understanding the science and um, kind of the process that um, a little bit of what we did to move in this direction. So over to you, Uva. Sure, <clears throat> perhaps a good way to start is by saying that the, the, the cannabis nurse, nurse is faced with the, a number of challenges one of which is to get a handle on the basic treatment trends that are emerging out of the relative newcomer to the field of medicine, the cannabinoid health sciences. And, and as all of you here pretty much know, um, reviewing the currently available scientific literature in such a way as to be able to make more informed and discerning decisions about if and what kind of cannabinoid-based therapeutics are thought to work for a particular condition or not can indeed be a very time-consuming and laborious task. Typically, and in the most general terms, you will want to engage in some kind of process to answer three basic questions. How does cannabis work? What is the evidence? And uh, can it work for, uh, for me or for those in, in my care? And, and the process typically starts by going to one of your favorite repositories of the scientific literature. And for most of us, that's either PubMed or, or PubCentral. And what you do is you typically start uh, with, uh, let's say you're seeing a, a patient tomorrow at noon and um, you want to prepare and review the evidence that's out there. And let's say it's a patient that comes in and uh, is diagnosed with post-polio syndrome, for example. So you, you go to PubMed, you punch in post-polio syndrome and cannabis, and you, you look at what, um, what results, uh, what links show up. Then typically, in order to approach it in, in a somewhat organized fashion, you would, you would, uh, um, you would select uh, all of the links, you, you copy and paste them into a separate document. And then you, you, you look through them and you, you discover that there are a number of them that are false positive. So you delete those right away. You know, for some reason, PubMed still 
shows up um, with a number of false positives that have nothing to do with uh, with the keywords that you input it. So so it takes a little bit to 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 weed out the weeds, if you will, and and look at at only those trials that that you were actually looking for. Now, one, once you've done that, you, you know, you, you want to separate those trials that directly examined the condition in question and components of the endocannabinoid system, you know, in, 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 in a direct association. You want to you want to separate them from those trials that may show related data that's relevant, you know, to 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 the condition. But but it's still not the prime focus of the trial. And, and, and one way to discern them is I call them, we call them either primary or related trials. So you want to create a, a bit of a difference because one is definitely going to be more relevant than, than the other. And then uh, uh, next you want to create some sort of um, um, uh, summary that holds the most value, valuable and practical ideas um, that that emerge out of those specific trials that, that that you're looking at, and one way to do that is to pull out the key findings. And um, in addition to looking at the key findings, you you also want to engage in some process of um, creating a value system that you apply to the different types of study studies that are out there. For instance, a, 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 a test conducted in the Petri dish, a laboratory trial, uh, only about 10% of all um, therapeutic indication that, that it might work in the Petri dish will actually translate into um, uh, human trials, into clinical trials. The same is true for, for animal trials, although the percentages are, are a bit higher. And then next in line in terms of, of the clinical hierarchies would be trials that would be, let's say, case studies or case series or expert opinions or surveys or cohort studies. And then you cross into, the, you cross that imaginary line of preclinical trials into clinical trials and you have the, the randomized trials, non-randomized trials, double-blind trials, and then you have the, 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 the top of the pyramid of hierarchies of trials, which is the a meta-analysis of all the clinical trials, which typically is used to pull out the most actionable, the most practical data that you, you can use to make then more informed and, and discerning decisions about uh, you know dosing considerations and so forth. So once you've done that, once you've done that, uh, you, you know you want to you know like I said a, a bit earlier, a create of a bit of a, a, a summary or a synopsis, a, a bit of a narrative that pulls together all the key findings and the the, the most valuable data that that gives you the the practical traction to serve that patient that you're going to see tomorrow at noon in the best possible way. And, and there are a few things that, that we can't control when it comes to working with the endocannabinoid system. For instance, uh, you can't control the speed with which a cannabinoid crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's very difficult to control um, how much vapor or smoke is lost to the atmosphere uh, and how much is actually absorbed uh, uh, through the tissue in your lungs. Uh, it's very difficult to determine, um, even within the same patient populations, the number of expressions of cannabinoid receptor sites, which can vary greatly from one person to another, even within the same, like I said, within the same patient population. It's interesting, you know, like, for, let me give you an example. Um, when... Uh, there is an in inflammation in your elbow, let's say in the case of rheumatoid arthritis. The elbow tissue will actually express increased amounts of CB2 receptor sites, um, which makes them a wonderful target to, to, um, f to, to administer cannabinoids to address the, the very, very tissue that is, is best suited to produce therapeutic effects. Now, at the beginning stage of an inflammatory process, uh, there is going to be a different number of cannabinoid receptors present than in the later stages of that process. So there are a lot of variables we, we can control, but, but there are a number of variables that we 
are able to control. And those are the ones you, you want to pay attention to as you look through um, to try to harvest the key findings as you review the trials that, you, that you've pulled out of your initial search. And, and the, 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 the basic key items that you want to give the most weight to are, for instance, you want to start out with the basic chemotype, which is defined by the THC to CBD ratio. And there are three basic types, the, the uh, THC dominant type, which is considered a chemotype one, the uh, cannabis chemotype two, which contains relatively equal amounts of THC and CBD, but for all in, uh, practical intent on per, uh, and purpose, um, most of the time, a one to four and four to one and everything in between is still considered a chemotype two. And then a chemotype three would then indicate a CBD heavy um, uh, strain or, or ca uh, uh, cannabinoid containing product. And, and it's these three basic distinctions that allow you to do a, a number of fantastic things straight from straight straight out of the gate. For instance, you can determine if if your client is absolutely insisting uh, or they're they're very concerned about uh, uh, cognitive changes. You can tell right away that in order for them, you know, to to engage them the maximum amount amount of therapeutic effects and being respectful of their their concerns that a chemotype three is an optimal starting point for them. Now, um, more and more trials are beginning to also indicate that particular ratios uh, show better results for specific patient populations. For instance, a chemotype one is clearly indicated for HIV, AIDS related anorexia and cachexia, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, uh, spinal cord injuries, for, for example. A chemotype 2 lights up in the literature for fibromyalgia as a starting point or for multiple sclerosis, while a chemotype 3, for example, lights up for mood disorders, anxiety, depression, and for a number of pediatric seizure disorders that are refractory to orthodox treatment methods. And so just based from, from, a, from a basic chemotype point of view, you know, the, the, there are a lot of things that you can pretty much determine out of the gate in terms of the specific gener uh, effects that you that you're looking to generate and of course avoiding to 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 cross that uh, thin line of of walking into adverse effects potential now the 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 next key item that you want to pay attention to in terms of harvesting your 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 key findings and in summarizing them is that you, you do want to spend it, spend, pay attention whenever possible to the sub-ratios of THC and CBD that was used in the, in the individual trials whenever possible. I mean, just think of it this way, a, a 5 to 1 versus a 20 to 1, 50 to 1, 100 to 1, think of it as a, the basketball court analogy. A 5 to 1 is a very different uh, a scenario than a 20 to 1 or, or, a, or a 100 to 1 with regards to uh, either generating a, a, a specific therapeutic effect or avoiding an adverse effect. And then the, the, the next thing, whenever possible, you want to pay attention to has to do with pulling out uh, clinical guidance when it comes to dosages. What THC, CBD actual dosages were used whenever possible. You want to pay attention to that. And then, of course, um, and I'm going a bit fast here, but, but I'm almost done. So the next one is, is a form-specific considerations. And, and most of you know there's a big difference between inhaling and uh, ingesting, for example, in, in onset size and, and concerns about titrating the specific effects that you want. And of course, then, then we, we, we can't forget about the entourage effect between various acid forms and various terpenes which you know, can be used to mitigate adverse effects potential and to, to empower and facilitate the generation of very specific therapeutic effects. And then at two more things I want to mention. One is that perhaps the most important one has to do with the patient's experience. And you always want to encourage the patient, or perhaps you want to do it with them, to create a session log. And then whenever you want to make an adjustment based on the patient's experience, 
you want to make one change at a time, you know. And so, so between those six items, you'll be in a, in a pretty good position to fine tune very specific effects that you want and to help them avoid the, the, the effects that they, they, they want to, to avoid. And then the last thing I wanted to point out, whenever possible, you want to pull out um, any data concerning um, a drug, a pharmaceutical drug interaction with, with uh, uh, cannabinoid-based uh, uh, constituents. And um, so, so putting all of this together, of course, you know, if, if there's only five trials for a relative rare condition such as uh, post-polio syndrome, it's no, no big deal. But if you have a, a condition such as anxiety, for example, with hundreds of conditions, it can take a significant amount of time to do it. And of course, then you want to focus whenever possible on the clinical trials. But, you know, you, you, you don't want to miss out on all the treasures that can be had by going through all the preclinical trials. It, you know, at least harvesting uh, uh, the data points of those, those specific key steps I was highlighting that give you the, the traction that you need in order to yeah, be as precise as possible and and in such a way as to um, create a predictability of effects that is pretty much as consistent as it can be. And, and with that, I'm going to uh, pass it on to Doug. Great. Uva, thank you so much. It's yeah, as somebody mentioned in the comments, it's always a pleasure to hear you talk about the process of utilizing cannabis medically in a in a science based way. And um, you know, I just want to say thanks again to CNN. And and before we move into the demo proper, um, I just want to acknowledge um, that in the uh, arrangement that we have with CNN and the partnership that we've created, um, the Canakees three hundred and sixty platform is available to the Cannabis Nurses Network um, at a discount. And that can be uh, um, accessed through the CNN members area and the affiliate link therein. And so clicking through that, you can go to the uh, Canakees site um, to explore the subscription options. And there is a discount affiliated uh, associated with that when you click through to do that. Um, but as Uva mentioned, there is a, the science is is rapidly expanding, and we all applaud that. But it creates significant challenges in utilizing the science as proper guidance, um, particularly trying to do that while you're um, seeing patients, writing articles, and do that in a timely way. And as as Uva and myself and our colleague Dave Rosenthal um, were exploring some different possible platforms, we were working on building and rebuilding uh, the, the database that Uva had created over a number of years. And what became clear over time is that the database itself and access to the aggregated science was in itself a critical and ultimately foundational service that was needed to move the uh, process of cannabinoid health forward. And that's what we really see with this is we see access to the science as something that can accelerate patient engagement. It can accelerate policy. It can accelerate the adoption of cannabinoid therapies with greater healthcare, and it can accelerate the engagement of patients who, who working with their doctors and hopefully seeing more of the science in a simpler form can feel more comfortable and have more trust in engaging with these therapies. So, so we're excited to see what will happen there. And so at this point, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, okay. And it looks like um, I am in. I'm going to double check. Um, Heather, text me if I'm not in. But I think every, I think everything looks fine. Um, so this is our home screen uh, at the Canakees website, and this is where um, someone would go to access subscriptions of the Canakees 360 platform. Um, 
I'm going to go right up to the top here to the Canna Keys 360 menu item. And you can see in the drop down, these are the four searches um, available to access the science. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to click on the Canna Keys 360. And here's, here's, an, here's a better overview of what's available. So we have the four searches you can access by medical condition search output and the associated science, an organ system search, which is a more systemic view of the science, uh, a cannabinoid search, which includes a range of cannabinoids beyond phytocannabinoids, and a terpene search, which is some of the primary uh, terpenes in cannabis, um, but also the related science that moves a little beyond cannabis into some spices and essential oils as well. We also have a glossary of terms for folks who are maybe new to some of the terminology, and we want this to be accessible to not just core practitioners, but people who are newer to it, both, both medical professionals and, and maybe patients and industry people and other folks. And lastly, there's a user guide. So users can click through and there's a guide for each search with information about how to use it, what the outputs are, and some tips and things to note while using the searches. So let's go right into a medical condition search. So this is the medical condition search um, search page. And there's a few, just a, wanted to show a few different things here. There's a few different ways to access the studies. So here's the, um, you can search in the conditions by the drop down here. We have nearly 240 conditions. So you could just select one that you want to uh, search and click go. Then there's also a uh, search by keyword. So you can see some of the ones that I've used recently, sleep, HIV, dementia, pain, memory, and bone loss. Um, there's access to the user guide again. Um, here's the top 20 conditions by the number of clinical studies. So this is a little quick guide, and these are live links to click through to these studies. But this in and of itself shows the conditions that have the most clinical studies associated with them. So it's a quick view of where the clinical evidence has really progressed for certain conditions. And coming down to the bottom of the page, here's the quick links for all the conditions in the data bank. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to uh, review um, everything that's in here, this is an easy way to do that. But let's go ahead and, and what we kind of jokingly call the 2020 condition of the year, anxiety and panic disorders. So executing the search, here's the output. So on the left side here, where there's a panel with the filtering, which I'll come back to in a couple of minutes. At the top, there's page quick links to jump to the different parts of the page, the condition overview, the primary and related studies, classifications in ICD-10, the drug interactions, which is a canned uh, bit of information that shows up for all the studies, as is dosing considerations and ranges. Um, you also have the ability to search other, can go right to other conditions from here either by the drop down or by a keyword search. So on the right and center here is the anxiety and panic disorders research dashboard. So this is the heart of the search and really gives the short information at a glance for the state of the science for, for the condition you've searched. So at the top here, you can see that we have the primary related studies and the total associated studies. So as Uva mentioned, we, we, we came to the decision early that we needed to break down the science in a couple of ways, because if we lumped all the studies into a single association with a condition or a cannabinoid, that you wouldn't be able to really focus in with some of the searches. So what we, what we decided was to create a primary relationship. And you can see where there's an info bubble. You can mouse over that and get additional information. But a primary study is a study that directly examines components of the ECS in the context of the of the condition search. So we have a methodology for determining whether something is primary or related. A primary study would often be something you'd see the condition specifically mentioned in the title or the key findings and the write-up is specifically talking about this condition. While a related, con related study, it might examine actions or components that are related to the condition, such as a symptom, and the, and the study write-up might reflect in an oblique way on the condition, it might mention it, but it's not focused on that condition. So the primary studies are the studies that are reflected in the dashboard numbers here. 
So coming down to the dashboard, you can see that we break down the state of the science by the study type. On the right here, we have the preclinical studies. We have the lab studies, animal studies, meta-analyses and reviews. There's also published case studies, um, you know, similar weighted studies go into this bucket. And on the left here, we have the clinical studies. So five human trials and then 13 double-blind placebo-controlled trials. We will be adding a third bucket to the clinical study soon because we, we have seen that there is enough of the studies that Uva mentioned, um, which are the clinical meta-analyses and really the gold standard for understanding the state of the science. So we will be pulling those out shortly. Um, but at a glance, you can just see how far the state of the science has progressed. And for anxiety and panic disorders, there is a decent amount of clinical evidence. Um, it's building on a, a decent amount of, of preclinical studies. And so we're starting to see some trends and directions. So let's take a look at what those are. So coming down toward the bottom of the dashboard, we have a state of the science panel. And this flags if there is clinical guidance or not, and there is. It, we also show if there is FDA or EU approvals of cannabinoid therapies for this condition. And for anxiety um, and panic disorders, there is not either FDA or EU approvals. Um, we also have the overall positive results, both for all the study, primary studies associated and for the clinical studies associated. And you can see here the overall positives are um, 83%. And for clinical results, they are 89%. And we'll dig into that a little more in a second, but this is for the component search, so if, or the component studied. So if it's studying CBD or THC or something like that, um, that's the positive or, or either negative or inconclusive or also mixed results. So they're seeing 89% positive, um, but we'll come back to that in a second when we do a little filtering. So then we have the clinical dosing summary. And this is, as Uva mentioned, one of the critical questions when it comes to patient engagement. It's the questions I get when people, um, when I talk to patients about cannabinoid therapy, people wanna know, does it work and how much should I take? And form is another consideration as well. So you can see here up top, we had 18 clinical studies and where possible, we pull out that data point in our review of the science where there is dosing information available. And there is for 11 of those 18. So to access that information, you click on the clinical dosing data. In a new window, a summary of, of the available dosing data for the clinical studies pops up. Quickly, what we have here is a study title, the key findings summary. So very brief key findings summary. So you can reflect if it's positive, negative, you can kind of read that there. There's the form. Most of these are ingestion. There is, I believe, some inhalation where it's not available, where it is in some of the published material. Hey, Doug, it didn't open. Oh, it didn't open? No. Nope. Oh, I think that it's because I have to share my screen to that specific one. Um, well, let me, let me just describe it. It opens in a new window, and there's a breakdown of the science in a chart. In a, I should say in a grid. It looks a little like an Excel spreadsheet. And each row is a science, um, is a, I'm sorry, is a study output. And each row includes the uh, study title, a brief key findings, ingestion, uh, a form, which includes just ingestion, inhalation, et cetera. There's a brief dose box and the year of publication. So I'm sorry, we couldn't do that. And I kind of don't want to mess with the screen sharing. Um, but sorry, you couldn't see that, but it is a, it is, we, we create a, a one page dosing summary so you can contrast different um, uses um, uh, and different approaches to the different cannabinoids, which are mentioned in the uh, dose field there. Um, and I will point out that all of the information you see on the dashboard will change with filtering. The filtering creates dynamic outputs and then you can drill in after filtering. So I'm gonna keep moving along. Um, as Uva mentioned, chemotypes and chemotype-based prescribing is, is really the way to understand how to use uh, phytocannabinoid therapies, cannabis therapies in a consistent way. Um, and here we have 
um, studies by chemotype, it's chemotype guidance based on uh, the studies associated with anxiety and panic disorders. So if you mouse over the donut chart, you can see that for anxiety and panic disorders, as, as most of you know, CBD is going to show up prominently and it does. It's associated with 35 primary studies, chemotype two, that four to one, one to four range, five studies, and chemotype one, high THC, six studies. So this is good guidance and just tells you, gives people a compass heading for understanding where the direction of the science is going. It doesn't show efficacy that you need to drill into the studies and understand, but at least shows where the direction of the science is going. Over here, we have the studies by researcher. That was early feedback that people wanted to see that information. And if you mouse over the individual charts, you can see uh, the uh, 17 in the US, 14 in Canada, Brazil, 14, Germany, Austria, um, and so forth. And at the bottom of the dashboard, you can see there's a synopsis, a, a, a large paragraph that summarizes the state of the science for, for cannabis and, and endocannabinoid therapies. This is reviewed regularly as the science progresses. Um, coming down, then we have the list of the science. So these are the individual studies associated. The primary studies are listed first. The most recent studies, you can see the year of publication is in the quick view here. Um, so they are listed in chronological order with the newest studies first. Um, you can see there's also some of them have these sigils. And the XY sigil means that there is sub-ratio information available. And the MG, the milligram sigil, means that there is some dosing information available. So let's click on the details. Oh, no, you might not be able to see this either. Bummer. I'm going to go see if I can change my view so that it'll follow just my screen. If you could give me just a second. Yeah, go ahead, Doug, and play around with that. See if we can see the actual screen you're looking at. You know, it's really interesting. I just wanted to add in here that a lot of times we hear um, people say, and specifically in the medical community, uh, there's not enough research on cannabis. <laughs> and so this, we really love this tool because now that just blows that argument out of the water because you've made it so easy for us to be able to access this. Um, in real time, and, and you'll be updating this too, right? As the newer information starts to come out and more research, is that how the subscription works is that it continues to update with research? Yes, what, you know, just, I'm, I'm gonna actually stay with this screen, so I'm not gonna get into the details, but I could describe it quickly. But, to, but, but Heather, thanks for that. Yeah, our, our approach is to um, update this continually. You know, we want to do that work and provide this service so practitioners like yourselves don't have to, so that you can keep up with the science because the science is growing. We were just looking at the results for 2020. If you search PubMed for cannabis and marijuana and separate searches, you're going to get over 7,000 results for just for 2020. So then if you bring in searches for the specific cannabinoids or other variations um, and endocannabinoids, um, the, the searches get well over 10,000 and that's for just one year. And the science is only going to grow. And especially when we, uh, end prohibition in this country and really, uh, take the reins off of the science, then things will really, um, accelerate. And so it became more critical for us to get this thing done and out there because the science is accelerating now. And what we're trying to do is aggregate it so people can, quickly get what the information that they need and then go do the work that they need to do, whether it's serving patients, changing policy, advocating for change and expanded access, et cetera. So just quickly, when you click details, you get a, a more specific view of the study that includes the study title, the short key findings, which is a sentence or two, the type of study. If it's a clinical study, you get the study sample size the study result, whether it's positive, negative, inconclusive, or mixed, uh, the cannabinoid studied if applicable, the phytocannabinoid source, if we were able to pull it out, that was reflected as something people wanted to see, the, the chemotype if applicable, and then there's the form or forms of, of administration, the sub-ratio, in this case it was zero to one, THC to CBD, 
and then the specific dosing, which also those elements are what show up on the dosing summary as well. Then there's the study location and year of publication. But most importantly, if people want to drill down to review the, the published material and what's available there, there's a link to the study. And if you click through, you can see the live published information that we used to that we used to draw the information out of and to enter into the data bank. So you can check the information for yourself if you'd like to. So coming down, you can see there's more um, milligram and, and uh, information there, which can guide your view, though we don't uh, really suggest scrolling through because the best way to do is to filter the results and then target what you want to look at. Um, now we're down to the related uh, studies. You can see that the studies don't mention anxiety or panic disorders in them, but have other titles. But for some reason, they were either anxiety might have been mentioned or the uh, there were related symptoms, that sort of thing. Um, and those are the uh, related studies, 69 of them. At the bottom, we have a brief overview with a description of the condition. They also known as the symptoms, um, some symptoms, and then you can see how they're the condition is classified, including the ICD-10 association, which includes a click-through so you can see which ICD-10 we've associated this condition. Um, at the bottom, there's some drug interaction information, which shows up for all the conditions. This is we, some primary information that should be available to people on CBD and THC pharmaceutical drug interactions, particularly around the P450 pathway. And we also have at the bottom, based on clinical observations and studies, these are the ranges that we consider to be named low, medium, or high dose, or for THC, micro doses, um, based on the clinical studies that we've reviewed that are in the data bank. So I'm just going to click top again. Um, and let's do a little quick filtering so you can see the activity of the filters. So again, as Uva mentioned, the clinical studies, if available, are really some of the best guidance for working with patients. So I'm gonna click the all clinicals uh, filter and you can see very quickly, it changed the uh, results to just show us the clinical studies. We still have the dosing data here. We could click through there. Um, you can see now the overall positives are 89 matching the clinical because that's all we are showing in the output. And you can see that all the clinical studies are associated with CBD. So just by that quick click, you can see that while there are chemotype two and chemotype one studies associated, all the clinical studies are using CBD. So that tells you something right there. But if you wanted to understand that further, you could come down and see that now the list is shortened and everything here you can see by the type of studies, they are all double blind and all human trials. And you can see there's more information you could click through them. Um, but you can also see that there's not only CBD showing up, but there's also Selexin and lavender oil. So you could say, well, what's going on with those? Well, if you wanted to, cl to click on um, some of these terpenes that show up, you could, you could refine your search further. So I've clicked on linalool, which is, as many people know, the primary terpene in lavender. Um, so if there's seven double-blind placebo-controlled trials, that's pretty good evidence. You could click through. Um, I wish I could show you, but you could click through and see the dosing information. You can see the positive clinical results are 100%. Um, the studies are in Austria and Germany. And if you come down, you can see some of you may or may not be familiar with, but these are mostly studies for Selexin, which is an over-the-counter uh, lavender oil extract that is available, um, mostly used in Austria and Germany, but you can find it on Amazon. It's actually available in the U.S., um, but it gets very strong results for anxiety and panic disorders and similar conditions. So you can see very quickly with just a few clicks, um, you can focus in the science and find just what you're looking for. I will note that in the filtering, let's take a quick look at what you can filter on. You can filter on study type or clinical preclinical breakdown. You can also filter on the chemotype. So if you wanted to see just what these chemotype studies are for chemotype three, you could click on that. You can also drill into the specific cannabinoids or endocannabinoids, and those are Everything you see in some of these fields are not all of the cannabinoids or endocannabinoids available. They are the only the ones that are associated with this condition. 
So this on of itself is a little bit of good information about what is associated with the science and with the condition um, that you're looking at. Same is true of terpenes. We also have receptor sites that if you're doing a paper on CB1, CB2 or GPCR55, you could you can filter um, any of the searches by receptor sites. Same is true of ligands and neurotransmitters. Um, those are not showing up in the dashboard in all the searches, but they're available in the search in the filtering panel. You can also filter if you wanna see the positive, negative, or inconclusive. By filtering, for example, on negative results, you get a little bit of an insight into contraindications for whatever is being studied. And then the year of publication, you can create your range if you wanna just see new studies. Um, and as you can see, the studies go all the way back to 1949 to present. We've already started putting 2021 studies in the data bank as well. So I'm gonna move things along um, and go to a cannabinoid search. So the cannabinoids, again, are not just phytocannabinoids for, of cannabis. There are a number of other ones as well, and I'll show you what those are in a second. Very similar to the condition search, you can pull down your cannabinoids and choose it from the dropdown. You can come down here and see the cannabinoids by the number of clinical studies. 162 for THC, 111 clinical studies for CBD. Um, and at the bottom here, you can see a quick view of the, of the buckets of cannabinoids that we have in the data bank. So we have the cannabis cannabinoids, the phytocannabinoids, um, and those are the ones where the science has progressed enough for us to place them in there. We follow the science with the associations that we have and the search um, groups that we have. We are entering them all the time. We just added two new conditions yesterday, and those are fully populated with the available science. Um, so we are reviewing cannabinoids, terpenes, and conditions all the time for and tracking the new science. And when there is enough, which can be two to three studies, especially if there's a clinical one involved, we will be entering those immediately into the data bank. We also have the endocannabinoids, our endogenous cannabinoids, the primary ones being anandamide and 2-AG. And you, as you'll also notice, we have a couple of the primary uh, enzymes that degrade those cannabinoids, um, FA and MOGL. And you'll see there's a fair amount of science around how those can be applied and how those can have beneficial results. Then there's the synthetic cannabinoid groups. We're tracking compounds like echinacea, which have binding affinity to some of the main cannabinoid receptors. And currently we also have pharmaceuticals in buckets by chemotype. We are going to be breaking these out into specific pharmaceuticals so that a doctor or nurse could look at a specific pharmaceutical and see what the state of the science is for that one. Um, so I'm going to go in so we don't run out of time for questions and take a look at CBD. So you'll notice the output is, is mostly the same, but there are some subtle differences in the dashboard. Same clinic breakdown of the clinical versus preclinical studies. You can see there's 519 primary studies. So trying to corral that many of studies and understand um, the science of CBD, well, the challenge is real. So we're excited to be able to present this along with the filtering so people can really break it down. And you can see that there's over 100 clinical studies, um, over 400 preclinical studies. The dashboard looks a little different. We break down the studies by organ system. So you can see for nervous system, it has the most studies associated with CBD, mental, emotional, 18, immune, 14, digestive, 14, and integumentary, 12. Um, we also have the studies by country of researcher. Um, and coming down, we have the top conditions related to CBD studies. So at a glance, you can see the top conditions that where CBD research is being done. Uh, unsurprisingly, it's epilepsy is at the top with 10, MS, Lennox-Gastaut, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, and, and so forth. We also have a quick view of the receptor sites. Um, CB1 and CB2, unsurprisingly, are the top two, but one of the TRIP family, TRIP-V1, um, GPCR55, and, and PPAR gamma are some of the ones that you see pop up all the time in the science. And at the bottom, this is where it gets really interesting because here's a list of the conditions at a glance where CBD has proven effects in, the cl in clinical human trials. So very quickly, you can see this list of studies that 
um, where there is some evidence. These are all live links. You could click through and and then search by CBD and get a, it, that's probably the best way to get a click, quick view of the studies for CBD and, and uh, for those conditions. Clicking also the all clinical if you just wanted to see those clinical results. Um, but just to, to give you a glance of, of how the dashboard changes when you click on the all clinicals, with this many studies, take an extra beat. But you can see now that just looking at the clinicals, the nervous system has a bigger percentage, 40 of them, mental, emotional, still high level at 15, digestive, um, muscular, uh, pops up a little higher and so forth. And you can see there's a little more focus in the receptor sites as well that are being targeted. Um, I'm gonna clear the filter and show you one more quick search, which is interesting. So if you, you saw the studies by organ system and you said, well, let me see those studies. So I'm gonna come down here to uh, the organ system and I'm gonna, uh, let's see, I'm gonna go to digestive system because that was the one that had some uh, more studies there. So you can see it quickly breaks it down to there's three double blind placebo controlled trials. Um, here's the digestive system. You can see multiple systems can be associated with studies. That's why they show up there depending on the condition. And you can see that the CBD um, has shown clinical results for just these three digestive conditions, colitis, Crohn's, nausea and vomiting. So very quickly using the, the uh, organ system search or filtering, you've, you've quickly distilled down for CBD the conditions where there's clinical evidence, saving a lot of time. And coming down, you can see that the hundreds of studies have been focused now. Um, and you could focus it further if you wanted to come back up and say, well, let's just look at those clinical studies and see what we have. So filtering, when there's a lot of studies multiple filters really um, focuses it down. So you just have quickly in a few clicks, focus down to three. And I'll just say as a Crohn's disease patient, uh, chronic patient, if I had seen this information when I was starting my cannabis journey, that low dose CBD is safe, but not effective in the treatment of Crohn's disease, I'll just say that would have saved me a heck of a lot of time. So we're hoping that this aggregated science saves you all a lot of time and saves patients a lot of time as well in understanding how to utilize the science. So clearing the filter, let's see a little time check. We've got just over 10 minutes. So I'm going to stop uh, the screen share. I'm going to come back and check the uh, box and see if there's any um, questions or comments um, from everybody and to see if we can answer anything. And if if not, I could do a terpene search and, and show some other functionality. Any is there any questions? Let me scroll through. I don't see any questions. So, Merity had a question about uh, um, capsaicin at the very bottom, I believe. Yeah, Uva, do you want to handle that one? Sure. Good. That's a good question, Meriti. Um, uh, capsaicin binds with trip V1, which is a cannabinoid sensitive receptor site. And uh, Doug, if you pull up uh, uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, it'd be a nice way to demonstrate it. Sure. Um, what happens is that, uh, uh, as you would expect, uh, with the um, uh, condition such as uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, uh, most of the filter results will indicate negative uh, results. However, there are a few studies that now indicate that um, uh, utilizing a topical application of capsaicin, uh, binding with uh, trip v one actually reduces, and it's one of the very few things that works uh, very, very uh, safely to mitigate this, this, this syndrome. And it's, uh, it's the capsaicin is the, the compound that gives um, uh, uh, pepper its, its, uh, its biting sting, if you will. And um, so in a nutshell, that is, is um, a, a comment to make about um, uh, capsaicin and filtering for trip V1. Yeah, you'll notice that when I filter for trip V1, it, it cut down the 108 meta-analyses to just eight. 
but it focuses, you can see here, there's a number of, of studies to explore about capsaicin um, and, and in, improve the overall positivity rate studying capsaicin from 4% for cannabis hyperemesis because they are looking at, at cannabis and it is creating those adverse effects. But looking at capsaicin, um, it is bringing the results up to 50%. And these studies are included in the data bank because they are looking at trip V1. So it's not necessarily a cannabis study. It is really a receptor site study and using an external uh, compound of, in capsaicin for the research. And that's why it's included here. And is certainly when it comes to cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is certainly relevant. Great, great question. Great point. Uva, do you see any other questions? Uh, I don't think so. So I'm just going to jump quickly over to the terpenes um, and do a quick search here. Very similar approach. Um, and I'm going to take a quick look at linalool that we talked about before. A uh, very similar dashboard to the cannabinoid dashboard. Uh, we've got 16 double-line placebo-controlled trials. Um, you can see that linalool has proven effects for the uh, for these conditions. Um, and what's interesting is if you um, search uh, filter by mental emotional system, you can see that they filter down quickly to PTSD, stress, life management, difficulty, depression, and of course, anxiety and panic disorders. And it's worth noting that the res we, we created four searches because even if you're looking for, say, you know, can lavender help anxiety? Coming at it from different sides, whether you're searching from the condition or you're searching from the cannabinoid or terpene side, you can get slightly different results, particularly when it comes to the primary or related designations. Um, a really good case in point is CBN um, and sleep. You see a lot of products on the market for CBN, but those products, um, unfortunately, are not really based in the science because there are no clinical studies for CBN um, at all. Um, and there's only one that's associated clinical study and that it used THC as the primary cannabinoid. So um, I could quickly go there, but I'm gonna stay here on linalool for a second. Um, and again, you can see the studies by the, the organ system, um, even with the mental emotional um, because there are some associations with the conditions involved. Um, so I'm going to come back up to here and go to the organ system just to give you the kind of bird's eye view. And, and the idea was to have a systemic view, which allowed for larger views of the science. And with filtering, you can focus in on some of those things. Um, so I'm going to go to digestive again. And very similarly to the uh, condition search, you've got some chemotype guidance, you've got the studies by condition, and then here you can see without any filtering, all the conditions that are associated in, our, in the Canakees 360 platform with that organ system. And with filtering, you could filter down and, and see which studies are related to which um, filter elements. And so let's go to THC and see what's there since it is the majority of this donut here on the chemotype trends. And coming down here, it's it's filtered your conditions list a little bit so you can see which digestive conditions they are using uh, focused research on THC. And if you wanted to come up and say, well, let's see which uh, clinicals those are. Since you've got almost 25, you do have 25 studies. So there you can quickly see Crohn's, IB, IBS, colitis, Reflux disease, amyloidiasis, nausea, vomiting, and hemorrhoids are the digestive-related conditions that have clinical research involving THC. So it's so the organ system view is a great systemic view. It's a, obviously a great tool for specialists, um, and that's one of the reasons we, where we wanted to focus on that. Again, coming down to the study list, you can see those primary studies with their with their nice information here. There's a lot of information about dosing, subratios, um, and they start pretty recently in 2019. Um, and you can go back in time by scrolling down into the 80s and uh, mid, all the way back to the mid 70s. And 
Then I will clear the filter. And with that, I'm just gonna come back to the main Canakees page. Um, and I will come back and see if I can uh, stop my share. So there's some great questions coming out. I, I think it was Kim, several of our students that are, or several of the nurses that are on with us today are students. And so there was some chatter going on in the chat box about, you know, I'm gonna, I'm emailing this information to my instructor. Um, my university should be using this platform as a resource for students. Um, and I think Kim, Kim just asked if you'll be partnering with UMD or other advanced degree programs and offering this platform for students. And so I wanted to give you guys a chance to address that. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Thanks for the question. Yes, absolutely. We are in the process of onboarding a couple of schools right now, and we are just starting the research out to other schools. So we certainly welcome any warm introductions that folks would like to make. And, and we do see that this is, we kind of joke internally that this feels like a a really valuable textbook of sorts, kind of a resource that as people are, are learning about endocannabinoid therapies to have quick access to the science, again, saves a lot of time with regard to accessing and understanding that. And they can focus on other aspects and learning the full and, and proper holistic way and to approach um, these therapies. So yes, we are working to, um, we have a couple of different ways that we work with schools. Um, to allow them kind of the best approaches um, as far as creating subscriptions, both for their faculty and their student bodies. So we're, we're eager to talk to more schools and we're really underway with that process of outreach to them. I see another question. Are you including studies that were the, in the NIH Cannabis and Cancer Symposium from December, 2020? Uva, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Short answer? Yes. Yeah, we, we, Uva, where, where do we, when we do our process of study identification, which is searching and identifying for studies, do you want to say quickly about that process? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's basically going to PubMed and we're not, you, you, not just utilizing PubMed, we're in fact also using other repositories like Cochrane, for example. And so what we do is we, we, we go uh, frequently um, uh, through uh, the data bank and we review uh, whatever studies that, that are not part and parcel of, of, uh, of Kanaki's 360. And, and so for the conditions uh, uh, section, for example, it, you know, I start with the letter A, I go, you know, and I punch in arthritis. And I, and I look for, you know, all the new cannabis studies that, um, that, that have, have been published since our last review, uh, you know, which, you know, typically um, it can vary depending on, on condition between a, a few weeks to a, a couple of months. So we, we're trying to stay on, on, on top of, um, of study identification and study entry with the with the focus primary on primary studies and with the focus on the most recent ones, um, so so th there's an ongoing process that looks at um, you know the conditions from A through Z uh, that are associated with cannabis, with endocannabinoids, and with uh, with with uh, terpenes and synthetic cannabinoids as well, and so you know it's 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 an ongoing process and. Um, but it's constantly being updated, and and uh, as soon as as I'm uh, down to the letter Z, I start again with the letter A, and and so forth. And we we are also reviewing the cannabinoids and the terpenes as well. So we're doing specific cannabinoid and terpene searches. The organ system science associated with it just grows because those associations are done by the conditions associated with the different systems. Um, but we're reviewing all of those, and we're also looking at, um, we're in the process of building some um, data mining technology to help us refine the search and have it done more automatically. And I would also just say and throw out there that we are interested to talk to folks like cannabis nurses to potentially, we wanna build our resources of, of study identification and entry um, 
and we will likely be putting out a job description for some support in that area in the near future. It wouldn't be a full-time thing, but it might be an interesting way for people who are interested in this area to supplement their engagement with the science. And I think, Heather, we are at time. Is there any last questions or comments? Such an amazing webinar. Thank you guys so much. I learned a ton. I'm really excited for Canna Keys 360. I know our nurses are thrilled. Um, hey, there's so many nurses out there always plucking up that new uh, uh, research that's coming out. And so having a, a job position where nurses could contribute in such a way is just beautiful. And I want to thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Blushing. Thank you, Doug, um, for this great webinar. And, and we hope that all of our Cannabis Nurses members will take advantage of this wonderful opportunity to receive uh, discounted um, services and subscriptions to Canna Keys 360. And when you do so, you're on the cutting edge of cannabis nursing and creating your uh, evidence-based practice as a cannabis nurse. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Heather. Thank you all. Um, thank you all for the kind comments. Um, we're excited and, and we'd love to hear your feedbacks. We we have a feedback uh, page on the website that also includes if you don't see a study that you think might we might be of interest, you can enter the link in there as well. So we're happy to uh, uh, bring this service to the cannabis nurses and all the great work you're all doing. So thank you. Pleasure to be here. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.